So let's continue our discussion about uh, Lagrange multiplier theorem. So let me recall what the result was. So I have, uh, I define L of X lambda, which is the Lagrange multiplier, Fx plus Hx transpose lambda. And the theorem was X star local minimum and regular implies there exist lambda star such that gradient of x l x star lambda star is equal to zero so the first derivative of the lagrangian is equal to zero with respect to x and d transpose second derivative of the Lagrangian is greater than equal to zero for all D in the first order feasible variations at X star. <clears throat> and we were trying to prove and we will today we will complete the proof of the first order necessary condition and uh, I'll refer you to the book for second order, the proof of second order necessary condition for optimality. So it, it's it's very, um, uh, so as you will see, the proof of first order necessary condition contains all the essential ideas and the proof of second order necessary condition is slightly more, um, uh, slightly more complicated than the first order necessary condition. But all the essential ideas are in the proof of FONC. Any question on this, uh, on the statement of the theorem? So we have two assumptions, local minimum assumption and regularity assumption. Okay, so what did we do in the proof uh, in the last uh, class? So we define <clears throat> So we defined FK of X Okay, so this was our uh, definition of the function FK, capital FK. And I defined S as the set of all X such that X minus X star less than equal to epsilon. <clears throat> and the claim we proved, oh, and we defined XK as argmin fkx x is in this set capital S. So this was the notations we had introduced in the previous class. And in the last class, we proved the following claim, xk converges to x star as k goes to infinity. This is my set capital S. This is my set hx equals to zero. This is the point X star. And this is my X1, X2, X3, X5, and so on. And it's converging to X star. <clears throat> okay, any questions so far? Any questions on the proof of XK converging to X star? This was covered in the previous class and I know I had, uh, I didn't have time to 
um, go over the proof more carefully, but uh, is there any question on what we did in the previous class? Okay, so looks like everyone agrees with this particular statement. Okay. So what happens when xk is converging to x star as k goes to infinity? So it turns out that for k sufficiently large, so if k is pretty large, then the point xk is going to be in the interior of this sphere, capital S. Okay, so this implies xk is in the interior of the sphere for k sufficiently large. What does this mean? xk is unconstrained local minimum of fk for k sufficiently large. Now, I want you to stare at this claim for some time and try to convince yourself that this is true. Okay, so we are making the following claim. We proved that xk converges to x star. So there must be a point after which the entire sequence must be in the interior of the set capital S, which is a ball centered at, at x star and with radius epsilon. And what this implies is xk, remember xk is the argument of fk. So xk is unconstrained local minimum. And the reason that it is an unconstrained local minimum is you can actually move in any direction and, uh, at, at this particular local minimum. So, so it turns out that xk would be an unconstrained local minimum because it's in the interior of the set capital S. So what's the property of a function with an unconstrained local minimum. So this implies gradient fxk is equal to zero and d transpose gradient of fkxk d is greater than equal to zero. Great. So this is the first order necessary condition. This is the second order necessary condition. So we are just going to look at the first order necessary condition and derive the first order necessary conditions for optimality in the Lagrange multiplier theorem. And similarly, you can look at the second order necessary condition and derive the second order necessary conditions for optimality in the Lagrange multiplier theorem. <clears throat> So we'll just focus on the FONC in this class. Any questions so far? Okay. So what is the gradient of FK at X or maybe XK? Let me evaluate it at XK. Let me just write the whole expression because I'm sure it would be better to have the expression in front of us. Okay, so this is the expression for fk. So what's the first derivative of fk at xk? So I need your help with that and I'll do the easiest one. 
which is the first term. What's the derivative of k over 2 norm of hx square? Any thoughts? So this is K summation I equals one to M I'm sure someone should be able to do it. No one wants to try. Okay, what about this last term? What is the derivative with respect to x of alpha over two x minus x star? X minus X star, X right. minus X, yeah. Right, cool. Okay, so let me write it in a short form. So I know that XK is unconstrained local minimum of fk so the gradient must be equal to zero which means that this fxk plus blah 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 plus blah 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 is equal to zero cool let me now multiply both sides by gradient h xk gradient h xk transpose inverse gradient h xk no oh uh, okay i got the transpose wrong so transpose should be here there should be a transpose here. Now my question is, how can we take the inverse of this matrix matrix transpose? So let's first think about it. This matrix is in our M. So gradient H of XK is in our n cross m so gradient h of xk transpose would be in m cross n this will be in our n cross m so the whole product is actually in is our m cross m okay now my question is why is this invertible why should this m cross m matrix be invertible what do you guys think? Sorry, can you say that again? So it is positive semi-definite, that's right. But the question is, why would it be invertible? So why would it have what it, why would it be positive definite if i can say that let me let me write down what this expression actually looks like this is no i don't think uh, hmm.
Yeah. Well, what do we know about gradient of H at X star? What is it that we know about it? So remember, we made two assumptions. One is X star is locally optimal, local minimum, and the second assumption was regularity. What does regularity mean? It means that all the columns of gradient of HX star are linearly independent, which means that this is full rank. Right, X star is regular implies gradient of HX star is full rank. Now the other thing we know is that K is very, very large. So XK is close to X star. So because gradient of HX star is full rank, it implies that gradient of HXK is also full rank matrix. And therefore this inverse is well-defined because it's a positive definite matrix. So X star regular implies that gradient of HX star is full rank. This implies that gradient of HXK is full rank for large K, which implies gradient of um, is full rank. Okay, I'll pause here for questions. Okay, so no further questions. So this is the key argument here where we have used regularity. So X star is regular implies that this, uh, this particular matrix is invertible. So now I can invert the matrix and multiply it by gradient of HXK transpose and multiply it to both sides of this equation. So left side is zero. So if I pre-multiply it by some matrix, um, I get zero, but on the right side, we see some cool things will happen. So I get zero equals to, I, I want to maybe use a short form. So gradient HXK transpose gradient HXK inverse, let me call this HK. Uh, we haven't used the matrix HK yet, so I think it's fine. <clears throat> so I have zero equals to Now I'm going to move this uh, KHXK on one side and the rest of the term on the other side. So what I get is KHXK is equal to minus HK gradient of HXK transpose
प्लस अल्फा एक्स के माइनस एक्स स्टार ओके नाउ व्हाट डू यू थिंक अबाउट द टर्म ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड व्हाट हैपेंस व्हेन आई टेक के गोइंग टू इंफिनिटी व्हाट अबाउट दिस टर्म व्हाट हैपेंस व्हेन के गोस टू इंफिनिटी कैन वी से समथिंग अबाउट इट इट विल एक्सप्लोड इफ एच ऑफ एक्स के इज नॉट जीरो it will explode but remember we said that k will explode for sure but h of xk is actually going to zero right this is something we did in the previous class so we have a, a term that goes to infinity and another term that goes to zero so i can't really say about the limit of the left side but then i know that the left side is equal to the right side so i can take the limit on the right side let's see what happens so does hk converge to something when i take the limit what would hk converge to x star uh this hk will not converge to x star but yes i i know what you are talking about inverse this xk will converge to x star so we'll have gradient of h x star this function gradient of x would converge to x star and of course we will have zero here because xk converges to x star so what i'm seeing is even though i cannot really say much about the left side i can say something about the right side that as k goes to infinity the right side converges and i know that right side is equal to the left side so what i get is limit k goes to infinity k h x k actually is equal to this big term and let me call this lambda star this will be my lambda star okay so what we have done after a series of steps is we have concluded that actually k multiplied by hxk converges to some vector and i'm going to call that vector lambda star okay now going back to the expression okay so this was the expression we had computed earlier and we had set it i mean this was equal to 0 we knew it so this is equal to 0 so remember you see here we have k h x k so i i know what the limit of this term is going to be as k goes to infinity so this term goes to 0 this term goes to gradient of f x star this term grows to gradient of h x star lambda star this term goes to zero as k goes to infinity so what do we have
this is my first order necessary condition in the Lagrange multiplier theorem. Okay, let's uh, go back and start tracing the train of thought that we had. Um, we started with this uh, condition we proved, I mean, with this result we proved in the last class that XK converges to X star. And then we realized that since XK converges to X star, XK is unconstrained local minimum of FK for K sufficiently large which implies that the first derivative of fk should vanish at xk and the second derivative is positive semi-definite at xk. This should be second derivative. Okay. Um, now we looked at the first derivative of the function at xk and I get this ugly expression and I look at this expression, I see that as k goes to infinity, I can take the convergence of, I mean, this term converges. This term, I'm not very sure because I have a k which blows up to infinity. I have a gradient which probably converges, uh, not which probably, which absolutely converges. And this one also converges, but this converges to zero. So I have a term blowing up to infinity. I have a term that goes to zero. So I don't quite know whether this term converges or not, and then I have the third term, which I know converges to zero. So what I need to do is figure out what's the convergence of k h x k, like what does it converge to? So in order to do that, we had to do some algebraic manipulation, uh, make some arguments about uh, invertibility of certain matrices. And then we realized that we can actually get the expression for k h x k uh, pretty straight in a straightforward manner and it actually turns out that the limit is equal to this ugly long expression. Uh, let's call this long expression equal to lambda star. Okay, so I know that my limit k goes to infinity k h x k is equal to lambda star. Once I know this I now can go back and plug it into this limit of gradient of fk xk. So I have this khxk term here. Now I know that it converges to lambda star. This term converges to gradient of hx star. And after taking appropriate limit, I conclude that this statement holds, which is the first order necessary conditions for optimality. And we needed both the assumptions, which is X star is local minimum and X star is regular in order to arrive at this expression of the first order necessary conditions for optimality. Any question on this first order necessary condition? Okay. The second order necessary condition can also be proven in a similar fashion, but you will have to go through some further derivations for getting the other expression, but it can be done. Okay. Let's move on to the next topic, which is we just talked about the case with equality constraints. So what happens when you have inequality constraint? So let's say I want to minimize the function such that hx, hix equal to zero for all i equals one to m and gjx less than equal to zero for all j from one to r x is in Rn. Now the question is, we know the result for equality constraint problems, uh, not the result, but we know the necessary condition for equality constraint problem. So what's the necessary condition for inequality constraint problem?
how to get the okay so let let me put the question in another way how can i make this inequality constraint problem into a equality constraint problem to add something to gi to g uh, to j right so this problem is actually equivalent to and gj x plus zj square equals to 0 okay j equals 1 to r and i'm not just minimizing over x i'm also minimizing over z okay now it turns out that these two problems are actu actually equivalent problems in the following sense a optimal solution x star for the problem here is part of the optimal solution for this problem. Okay. So after doing, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Professor, can you repeat that? So the optimal, so this is, let's say X star is the optimal solution here and X tilde star Z star is the optimal solution to this problem. Then X star is actually equal to X tilde star. Right, are you convinced of that? Okay, so this is one way of reducing uh, inequality constrained problem into a equality constrained problem. And then you can apply the Lagrange multiplier theorem to this particular problem, to the equality constrained problem. So in order to apply that, what we need is a generalization of the notion of regular point. Okay, so, so X is regular. Okay, so let's say, so first I need to define active constraints at X. So A of X is equal to J in one to R such that GJ of X is equal to zero. So this is the set of active constraints at X. Okay, so this is the point. So at X, if GJ of X is equal to zero, then J is an active constraint at X. Then I have to extend the notion of regular point. X is regular. If and only if gradient of H1 X, gradient of HM X, gradient of gjx j that are active are linearly independent Okay.
Now the third thing I want to do is define the Lagrangian. So now the Lagrangian depends on three parameters. I have fx, I have hx transpose lambda, and I have gx transpose mu. Okay, so any question on these three definitions? So this is the Lagrangian definition, this is regularity, and this is active constraints. Oh, first order feasible variations. I also need to define that. Sorry about that. So V of X, D in Rn such that gradient of hi x transpose t equals to zero and this should hold for all i and gradient of gj x transpose t equals to zero and this should only hold for the set of active constraints okay so now i have defined all the four things needed for introducing kkd theorem Okay, so first thing we need to understand is the set of active constraints. So not all constraints can be active at a point X. Uh, let me actually give you a picture, that'll be even better. So this is my G1 X equals to zero. This area is G1 X less than equal to zero. This is my G2 X equal to zero. This area is G2X less than equal to zero. And if I look at a point here, so at this point X, so X1, the set of active constraint is just one because only G1 of X is equal to zero. G2 of X is less than zero. At this point X2, my set of active constraint is two because only G2X is equal to zero. And at this point, X3, my set of active constraints are one comma two because both constraints are active at that point. The G1 of X is equal to zero and G2 of X is also equal to zero. Okay, so that's the notion of active constraints at X. And then we, we, we say that X is regular if uh, the derivative of all the, so these, are, these, these constraints are always active because H1, H of X is equal to zero. And then all the other active constraints, they all form linearly independent set of vectors. And then of course, Lagrangian and uh, the first order feasible directions are uh, defined in an appropriate way. Okay, any questions so far on these definitions? So this brings me to the, the main theorem of this class, which is the KKT theorem. X star local minimum and regular implies number one. then there exists lambda star mu star such that
the first derivative of the Lagrangian at the optimal points are equal to zero. mu j star is greater than or equal to zero for all j. Mu j star is equal to zero for all j that are active. No, for all j that are not active. So these are the first order necessary condition. And the second order necessary condition is D transpose second derivative of Lagrangian. Okay. Have any of you heard of KKT theorem before in the context of optimization? No. This is quite uh, heavily used in optimization literature. Um, so, so that's why it's very important theorem in optimization. Now these two vectors, lambda star and mu star, they are called Lagrange multipliers. And there is another condition prime which is typically written as mu j star g j x star equals to zero for all j and this is known as complementary complementary flatness condition. The proof essentially, proof of this result essentially follows from the Lagrange multiplier theorem after you massage the, after you convert the inequality constraint problems to an equality constraint problem. And then you uh, apply the Lagrange multiplier theorem, you get the KKD theorem. And of course you can also derive KKD theorem from, from the first principles. Um, and 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 you will get uh, the same result essentially following the same train of thought as we did in the for the proof of lagrange multiplier theorem what is important 
here, I think in KKD theorem, which is sort of less well understood, is this notion of regularity. So a lot of papers would use KKD theorem without necessarily arguing that X star is a regular point. And I think that's a mistake. I mean, you could, you know, pe people should write that, let's assume that X star is regular and then use KKD theorem. But many a times people use KKD theorem without necessarily invoking regularity, which I feel is uh, wrong. It, one has to make that assumption or one has to prove that X star is going to be regular. So KKD theorem is applicable there. Now let's look at some uh, problems where you have equality as well as inequality constraints and then try and see whether regularity holds in that situation. Um, so let's consider the problem where I want to minimize f of x such that x is greater than or equal to zero and summation xi is equal to one. So this is the simplex constraint. Okay. Let me put it in the standard form. So this problem is same as I want to minimize f of x minus xi less than equal to zero, summation of xi is equal to one. What's the gradient of h of x here? One. Yeah, just one. What's the gradient of GJ of X? Or GI, whatever, GJ of X? Negative one. Negative one where? So only at the ith position. So it's zero, 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 but it's negative one at the ith or jth position. Okay. So it's actually very easy to see that gradient of h of x, gradient of g1 of x, all the way up to gradient of gn of x, is actually not linearly independent. Right? So, so what, what's the, now the question is what happens in this situation? As you can see, so gradient of G1 to Gn, if you add them all up, it will be minus one, minus one, minus one, all the way down. And gradient of Hx is just negative of that vector. So therefore they're not linearly independent. But it so turns out if you think about it carefully, you will realize that not, not all Xi's can be simultaneously zero. Right? So all Xi's cannot be simultaneously zero. Okay, so not all inequality constraints would be active at any point X in the set. So why can Xi's not be simultaneously zero? Because the Xi's have to sum to one 
So at least one of the XIs have to be positive in order for, um, for all the XIs to sum to one. And which means that all of these constraints cannot be active constraints. So G1 to Gn, they all cannot be active at the same time. And therefore, this implies that all X in delta N are regular. Because the set of active constraints at any point X will always be less than N, strictly less than N, because one of them has to be inactive, at least one of the constraints have to be inactive. Okay, so in the case of simplex, all points are regular. So therefore, KKD theorem can be easily applied. But if you have a more complicated set of constraints, then it's not obvious that the points uh, in the set would be regular or the optimal point would be regular. So you have to be cautious when you're applying KKD theorem in those situations. Any question? Cool. So today what we did was we talked about Lagrange multiplier theorem and we talked about KKD theorem. And let me go back to the KKD theorem exam, uh, statement. And we learned about these two things, lambda star and mu star, which are known as Lagrange multipliers. What we are going to do in the next class is we'll talk about sensitivity theorem, okay? And we'll try to give an economic meaning to this value lambda star and mu star. And before we get to the next class, which will be on Monday, uh, I want you to go back and read assignment one, problem number four, where you computed lambda star uh, in that problem. Uh, it, it was the electricity market problem. And uh, you had said, you, I mean, you had some thoughts about, or there was some questions about what exactly lambda star and mu star means. So I want you to go back and take a look at it. And uh, in the next class, we will discuss what exactly it means to uh, what exactly does Lagrange multiplier mean in an economic setting? And this problem is uh, very much intricately related to how commodities are priced in real markets um, or in many markets. And some of the applications of sensitivity theorem or Lagrange multiplier theorem to some of the uh, research topics that I'm working on in the context of transportation market and electricity market. So that's what we will be talking about in the next class. So sensitivity theorem, and we'll talk about Fritz John necessary conditions for optimality. So that's a different necessary condition than uh, KKT theorem. And then we'll move on to uh, deriving algorithms. So from Wednesday onwards in the next week, uh, we'll talk about algorithms for computing X star, lambda star, and mu star um, under a wide variety of uh, settings, okay? Um, so that's all. Uh, I'm available for questions if you have any on what we did today in the class. And if there are questions for office hours, I'll be available uh, in like 15 minutes after the class is over, once the video gets downloaded. No questions on the class? Great, so I'll see you guys in 15 minutes in my office hours. So have a good rest of the weekend.